So good afternoon. Nice to see you all. I uh, am delighted to have a chance to introduce my very longtime colleague and friend, uh, Dr. John Renner. Um, I've worked with uh, Dr. Renner for many years in all sorts of different capacities across uh, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, and all other manner of things focused on addiction treatment and assisting uh, patients with substance use disorders in getting the best possible care. And John is really a national leader in this and has been tireless in his national efforts to assist patients and clinicians also in getting the education that they need to deliver high quality care for patients with substance use disorders. So I'm really delighted to have have him here today um, to give us a, a talk. I want to just tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. Renner. He is professor of psychiatry at Boston University School of Medicine and associate chief of psychiatry for the VA Boston healthcare system. He uh, graduated from Yale and Case, and Case University School of Medicine. He's been working at the Boston VA since uh, 1979. He currently directs their outpatient addiction treatment program. He's also the associate director director of uh, uh, Boston University Medical Center's General Psychiatry Residency Program and is director of their Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship Program and in that capacity has trained many clinicians who are now out in the field practicing addiction psychiatry. He's written and lectured extensively on the treatment of alcoholism and drug addiction. He's president, current president of the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry and vice chair of the APA's Council on Addiction Psychiatry. He's written, I'm not not going to continue, but he's written numerous books and articles. He really single-handedly, when um, buprenorphine came onto the market and was um, uh, uh, available for prescription, John, like single-handedly, was on a plane, I think, every week training people across the country and has really done um, as much for um, this field in that capacity as anybody else I can think of. So with that, I want to welcome him to the podium, and he's going to give us a talk here on a topic that I think you'll agree is really important, which is the interface of pain, addiction, and psychiatric comorbidity. So with that, Dr. Renner. Okay. Uh, thank you, Shelley. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm uh, proud to have been asked, and I hope you're going to bear with me today because this, this will be a different talk. At least I usually talk about clinical issues, and sometimes I get into data and research, uh, and I thought that this would be an opportunity to do something a little different. Uh, and uh, I, I wanted to sort of share with you sort of my concerns over where we are right now and where I think we are going in terms of sort of medical practice and the management of addiction in patients. Uh, I don't have any disclosures that are relevant to this presentation. Uh, I'm going to begin by looking a little bit at opiate use disorder in the United States and go over some of the changes uh, that have occurred in the last two decades. I want to talk very briefly about the way we understand addiction, the way we now think about tolerance and physical dependence, and then I want to really walk us through the evolution of the current epidemic of opiates, how this happened and how it evolved. Then get back to the question of the interface, the, the overlap between addiction, chronic pain, and psychiatric disorders, and then at the end just some general thoughts about technology. Uh, and patterns of illness and, and what we need to think about as clinicians. So to start uh, with the uh, epidemiology, if you will, I'm sure everyone has seen versions of this slide. Uh, the opiate problem in the United States was pretty quiet and not much was going on after the Second World War. It was sort of there, it sort of perked along fairly quietly. And then all of a sudden in 1995, something dramatic changed. Uh, and what you see there is the beginning of what we now recognize as a very significant opiate epidemic, uh, and particularly an epidemic in the abuse of pain medications. Uh, this slide just continues that data from the last slide. It shows you what happened since 2002. 
Numbers kept going up slightly after that original peak, but I want you to pay attention to the last two years because after these slow gradual increases, for the first time we're beginning to get a signal uh, that something has changed, that the numbers are starting to drop. Uh, these are the numbers of people with opiate use disorder related to pain medications. And those numbers have finally begun to come down, and we'll, we'll talk about what might be going on there. Uh, lest we forget that heroin is still a problem, uh, this is the parallel information on heroin. And you can see as the opiate pain relief abuse problem was going up, the heroin problem was going up. Uh, and this was being driven by a more, much more sophisticated distribution system coming from Mexico. I'm not going to talk about that in, new de in much detail today, uh, but it's, now, it's similar now to ordering a pizza. You just call up your dealer and you'll probably get home delivery within 10 or 20 minutes of whatever heroin you want. Uh, price is good, the quality is very high, so it's a very efficient business. But that's really not going to be my focus today. Just want to throw in this last slide, which is heroin use disorder. And what you can see here, just look at the far end of that slide, and you'll see a similar drop. Maybe we're suddenly seeing uh, a change in the number of people uh, who have heroin use disorder. So something may be happening uh, in the last year or two. Now, th this takes these same numbers and puts them into a slightly different perspective. This is comparing 2014 with 2015. Uh, and this is not the number of people with the disorder, but just uh, the number of people who were using. Uh, you can see prescription pain relievers, 4.3 million in 2014, dropping to 3.8 million in 2015, and heroin dropping from 0.4 million to 0.3 million. So there, there seems to be a trend there in terms of use. But uh, that, unfortunately, has not resolved the problem uh, for any of us. Uh, so heroin use has dropped. Uh, it's possible that the abuse of opiate pharmaceuticals has dropped. But what has not dropped is admission to treatment. Uh, treatment numbers continue to go up. And what's even more worrisome is that uh, there's, there's been no significant drop uh, in what is probably the most dangerous thing, and that is overdose deaths. Those deaths are going up, and I'll show you some more information on that. What, what I make of all of this is that I think that the information is finally reaching the casual users and the general public that opiate pain medications are risky and dangerous. And I think the more casual social users are cutting back on their use or stopping. And it looks like, if we look at the high school data, that those numbers are also dropping. So I think it's no longer becoming casual and easy for people to use opiates without much thought. And I think they're getting that message. But what's happened in the meantime is that we're left with the people who actually have opiate use disorder. They are the ones who simply can't stop. Uh, they now have an illness, and that illness is continuing to drive their behavior. And that's really what's driving the overdose deaths, and that's what's driving our admission data. Uh, now, the, the next two slides just give you a snapshot of the overdose deaths. This is information from 1990. Uh, this looks at the pattern across the United States. Uh, the obvious darker red are the, the higher places where you're seeing a significant increase in, in overdose deaths. This is 2014. Look at, look at the dramatic change uh, in, in that period. Uh, this is what's going on around the country. Uh, but I wanted to also just throw in some specific information about Massachusetts because I, I think we, we need to think in terms of what's happening locally and what's our part of this whole picture. Uh, th this was uh, the morbidity and mortality weekly report from the CDC. Uh, this came out the last week of last year, so this is about two or three weeks old. So this is the most recent data that is available. And we'll just go through this. One of the things they mentioned here that since the year 2000, 300,000 people have died of drug overdoses in the United States. Uh, in 2015, over 50,000 people died. Of those deaths, about 33,000 were deaths related to opioids, so the rest of them were other drugs. Uh, 
Uh, heroin deaths were almost 13,000, so about 20,000 of those opiate-related deaths were opiate pharmaceuticals. Uh, synthetic opiates, not counting methadone, increased by 70 percent between 2014 and 2015. That is an enormous increase. And that's increasing in an era when we are getting more aware, alert to this and more wary. This may well reflect the availability of fentanyl-tainted uh, heroin. Uh, but uh, that's been a little harder to pin that down. This is the data from the uh, CDC report. Uh, if you just look at the, uh, this line here, if I can show it to you, this is Massachusetts. I just wanted to focus on that. This is 2010, and these are the numbers from 2015. Uh, pulling these numbers out to the actual numbers you're seeing there, uh, in 2014, there were 178 deaths in Massachusetts related to uh, overdoses on natural and semi-synthetic opioids, not methadone. In 2015, that had gone up to 225. That's an increase of 25, almost 27 percent. The national increase in the United States in that one year was 2.6 percent. So Massachusetts was, just compare those numbers. The national number was 2.6, Massachusetts was 20 point, uh, uh, or 26.9. So we've got a local problem. Uh, we are one of the hot spots in the country, uh, and I think we, we simply have to pay attention to that fact and take it very seriously. Uh, as I mentioned before, I, I think that the heroin part of this is probably related to fentanyl. It's not, it's not diverted fentanyl from pharmaceutical companies, but it's illicitly produced fentanyl from China that's being shipped to Mexico, that's getting mixed with the heroin in Mexico, and then uh, coming into the United States. CDC also noted that there was a lot of mixing of drugs in these overdoses, that it was opiate pharmaceuticals that were thought to be the primary cause of the overdose, but they were seeing other things like benzodiazepines, heroin, cocaine, and alcohol. Uh, it was a mix of things. Uh, and lastly, I just want to throw this, this last piece in. I couldn't resist this one tidbit of information. Uh, this is, comes from the same CDC report. Uh, this was published information just before Christmas last year. Heroin overdose uh, su numbers surpass drug or gun homicides in the United States for the first time. So we, we've now reached a period where opiate overdose deaths are killing more people than automobiles and guns. Uh, so that, that has dramatically changed the picture of accidental death in the United States. So we'll sort of move on from some of these numbers and talk a little bit about uh, the neurobiology of addiction. Uh, and again, I'm not going to really go into this in great detail. I just want you to notice that there's some concept changes in how we think about this, particularly in how we think about the tolerance to opiates, physical dependence, and addiction. And that is a critical issue because of the pain issue, as, as we will get to in a few moments. Uh, Neurophysiologic changes uh, in reward in, involve in inhibition and emotional circuits in the brain. Uh, as psychiatrists, I think we're all well aware of the fact that the, there is a very interesting overlap between affect, emotions, and addiction. And it's all going on in the same part of the brain. Uh, their associated behavioral changes involve craving, obsessive thinking, erosion of inhibitory control, compulsive drug use. All of this is what we see with addictions. These are all neurological, biological changes. Uh, the risks for this uh, are driven by a number of things. The latest estimate from the genetics are that 35 to 40 percent of the risk for becoming addicted is genetic. Uh, so this major factor uh, in why people become addicted. Uh, we also know clearly that adolescence is a significant risk factor. Uh, that's related to at least two things, one of which is the general neuroplasticity of the brain, that if you expose the growing brain to these various substances, the effect that it has is significant. Uh, we've known for a long time that this was the case. For instance, if you start smoking and are exposed to nicotine when you're in your late 20s, practically nobody becomes addicted to nicotine. Uh, but if you start smoking 10 years earlier, almost everybody is going to become addicted. 
You know, so the age of the brain uh, matters in terms of when you're exposed to these chemicals. Uh, another factor which is separate from the neuroplasticity is just the development of the frontal lobe. Uh, and as everyone who's a parent here knows, your adolescent children do not have fully developed cognitive functions. Uh, and their capacity for higher level judgments, their capacity for impulse control, their capacity for thinking before they leap uh, is not really fully developed. Uh, and that is a factor in, in terms of the poor judgment calls about using these drugs, uh, and then it impacts their ability to change the behavior. Now, talk a little bit about tolerance and physical dependence versus addiction. Uh, tolerance and physical dependence involve, occur in almost all individuals who are exposed to opiate pharmaceuticals. So if you have major surgery and you're in the hospital, uh, you're probably going to develop tolerance, you're probably going to develop physical dependence. If the drugs are not tapered or they're stopped abruptly, you will probably have minor withdrawal symptoms. They will disappear quickly uh, and, and they're not going to be much of a problem for most people. Uh, on the other hand, addiction occurs in a much smaller percentage of people. Uh, it's a separate, separate molecular process from the process that involves tolerance and physical dependence. It evolves more slowly uh, than tolerance and physical dependence does. The withdrawal lasts longer. It disrupts multiple brain functions. Uh, and as I mentioned before, genetic factors are an issue. The point that I want to make here is that addiction is not the same thing as tolerance and withdrawal. And uh, if you look at the older medical texts and you look at the earlier versions of the DSM, particularly in DSM 3 and 4, they overemphasized the role of tolerance and physical dependence. And in some of the older texts, they actually merge this with addiction. And it, it's not clear when you're reading some of this material when they're talking about addiction and when they're talking about physical dependence. Uh, one of the significant changes with DSM-5 was to clarify this distinction. And really, you cannot make a diagnosis now of opiate use disorder if you're only basing it on the presence of tolerance and uh, physical dependence. You have to have the behavioral changes. You have to have the craving. You have to have the use when you know it's risky. You have to have the difficulties trying to stop and not being able to stop. All of those things are necessary there if you're going to meet the criteria for an addiction diagnosis. Uh, now, I want to spend a, a bit of time now uh, looking at how this epidemic evolved. Uh, and to appreciate that, I need to go back to the early part of the 19th century because I want to make a point about science uh, and technology and human behavior uh, and how addiction has sort of played out in, in, that, oh, in that situation. Uh, and we'll begin with the question of the overlap of pain and opiate use disorders, because that, that is a very long story and a long history. Mu opiate receptors are concentrated in brain re regions that regulate pain receptors and pain perception, but it's also the same regions of the brain that regulate uh, pleasure, the amygdala, the VTA, the nucleus accumbens. So how do we get from pain meds uh, which were prescribed for older people in legitimate medical practice to the situation we have now with addicted adolescents. The story begins in 1804, uh, and that was the time that morphine was distilled from opium. And you'll see that uh, the, what this triggers is a long story where science is helping us produce much more potent substances. We're going from sort of natural compounds that some people got difficulty with, but did not nearly have the capacity to produce addiction uh, as we eventually deal with today. The next critical thing in our story is the invention of the hypodermic needle. That was in 1853. Uh, and it was really a necessary component uh, to make it possible to administer opiates in ways that really triggered very significant changes. The first big obvious issue with opiate addiction in the U.S. occurred after the Civil War. 
Uh, morphine analgesia became standard practice at that time. So you have changes in technology, changes in medical practice, and you had lots of individuals who were injured in the war who were treated with morphine and then became dependent on morphine. And for the first time, we had a morphine use disorder, except it had a different name. It was called soldier's disease or soldier's illness. Uh, and I think words mean something. Uh, I think it's important that it, this was not a pejorative term. Uh, being a soldier after the Civil War was an honored situation. Uh, and, and people got their meds from their physicians. It was routine for your, your great-great-grandfather, if he was practicing or she was practicing medicine in, in the late 1800s, you had people who were addicted uh, and you were providing morphine to them. That was not unusual practice. Next marker, if you will, is 1898. Bayer isolates diacetyl morphine. They name it heroin. And for a while, that was a medication. Uh, that you could, you could get. Uh, all of this led eventually to a system of treatment programs. It became clear that it was difficult for physicians to manage addicted people in their private practice settings. And we had a whole series of morphine maintenance clinics. There were 44 of them that were established in the first part of the, of the century. Uh, and most major cities at that time had a morphine maintenance clinic. So this whole concept in terms of methadone maintenance or now buprenorphine maintenance, if you will, goes back to these morphine maintenance clinics. I'm, I'm gonna show you a few pictures along the way here. I just want you to see some of the people involved in this. This, this is Alexander Wood. Uh, th this is the uh, physician who invented the first functional hypodermic syringe. Uh, and the comment here is that it was not really possible uh, to develop serious problems with morphine until this syringe was available. Uh, and that really changed, that bit of technology changed the landscape uh, in terms of addiction. Next marker here is the Harrison Act, uh, 1914. Uh, the attitudes in the U.S. changed dramatically about addictions. Uh, changed dramatically, particularly about opiates, but this was also in the same era that we were leading up to alcohol prohibition. Uh, so we, we had gone from a fairly laissez-faire attitude to a prohibitionist attitude. Uh, the Harrison Act made it illegal for physicians to prescribe opiates to individuals with addiction. Uh, a lot of physicians did not want to comply with the act because they felt it was a legitimate part of medical practice. More than 3,000 physicians were sent to jail you know, because they refused to stop prescribing. Uh, but ultimately, the, the American Medical Association did not back them up. The Supreme Court upheld the Harrison Act. Uh, and the end result was that organized medicine really just got out of the business of treating opiate addiction. And basically, we had a major shift in paradigm. So we went from seeing this as soldier's disease or a medical illness to seeing it as a criminal problem. Uh, and we basically handed the management of opiate use disorders over to the criminal justice system. Uh, that change did not make the problem go away, uh, but it changed from a morphine problem to a heroin problem. And sort of the illicit heroin supply system and heroin use disorder now became the dominant opiate problem in the United States. And that really continued that way until after the Second World War. Uh, so what changed then? After the Second World War, the heroin problem got progressively worse, particularly centered in New York City, to, to the point that the criminal justice authorities in New York felt they just could not manage anymore. Uh, they approached Vincent Dole and his wife, Marie Nicewander, who was a psychiatrist, uh, and asked them to try and come up with something. Uh, Dr. Dole uh, looked over the available meds, was aware of the history, and settled on methadone uh, as an opiate that could be used to treat uh, opiate use disorder. Uh, his early studies appeared to be quite successful. So in 1974, we have the first methadone maintenance programs. Uh, it was a clear and implicit assumption that the criminal justice model had failed. Uh, but medicine certainly was not comfortable going back uh, 
to this model of a medical disorder or accepting it. And it's certainly no accident that the whole methadone clinic system that was established was really done in what I would consider a, a grossly ambivalent system. Uh, that is, it was outside of mainstream medicine. In most places, methadone clinics were not established inside hospitals. They were out around the corner, often in a bad neighborhood in town. Uh, and they disconnected, it was very hard for people to get medical care, it was hard for people to get psychiatric care, uh, but the treatment was available within that clinic system. It was very heavily regulated. Uh, that made it difficult to recruit physicians to work in the system because of the degree of regulation uh, and the degree of stigma that was still attached uh, to the whole problem. Uh, and I think in general, the medical community just never co was comfortable with this model. The amount of education that went on in medical schools and residency programs was very, very minimal. Uh, so, I mean, we never took on the notion in a really serious way that opiate addiction was a medical problem and that we really had to train doctors to do it. Uh, so, we didn't buy into it particularly well. And almost not surprisingly, the patients didn't buy into it either. Uh, best we can tell is that less than 10% of the heroin addicts in the country ever went into methadone treatment. The maximum number of people that were in treatment during this era were about 100,000. There were probably well over a million people uh, who were heroin addicts or had heroin use disorder at that time. And from a public health point of view, if you were only able to effectively treat about 10% of the individuals with the condition, you're not very likely to be very successful uh, in managing the condition. Uh, so we didn't get very far, uh, at least not nearly uh, to a point where we were resolving the problem uh, with the methadone system. Uh, now I, I want to shift gears a little and move away from tr sort of addiction treatment to something else. Does anyone recognize this picture? This, this gentleman? Anybody know who this is? Okay. Put a name to this face. Uh, does, that, does that ring any bells to anyone? Okay, well, let, let me tell you the story here. Because uh, this, this guy is really critical for your understanding of, of what's happened in the last 20 years. Uh, Arthur Sackler was a psychiatrist. Uh, and he gave up clinical practice fairly early on after sec the Second World War. And he went into the advertising business. Uh, and it turned out that he was an absolute genius uh, in terms of advertising and marketing. Uh, and if you, if you ever wonder why we have detail men banging on the door coming in to see you and trying to get you to do things, or you wonder why you turn on your television at night and every five minutes there's a new purple pill uh, and uh, there's some bathtub flying by with a couple in it, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you can thank uh, Dr. Sackler. Uh, <laughs> He developed the concept of aggressive marketing directly to physicians. Uh, he developed the concept of free medical education, courses for physicians. Not only free courses, but he would ship you off to really fancy summer resorts and you could stay for a few days and you would get a few lectures and you could enjoy the beach and it would all be free. Uh, and the whole concept of research in a very different way because now what you had were the drug companies purchasing the researchers and purchasing the research studies and lo and behold we're getting very interesting results uh, that uh, often seem to suggest that their drugs were always effective and had minimal problems. Uh, there were doctors, speaker bureaus. I don't think Roger does this, but uh, you know, you could make a million dollars a year <laughs> just running around the country, uh, speaking to other physicians, and and telling, sharing your expertise about uh, you know how effective uh, all these medications are. Uh, and I don't want to make joke about this because everything I've told you is real. <laughs> Uh, the, he also developed the whole concept of direct consumer advertising. And we take that so much for granted 
uh, the, what I didn't realize until literally this morning, I was looking at an email on something else. We're almost the only country in the world where direct consumer drug advertising is legal. The rest of the world does not accept that. Uh, but we certainly have bought that hook, line, and sinker. Uh, so all of this, uh, we began with uh, Dr. Sackler. Uh, the next part of our story uh, is, occurs in 1952, and it turns out that Dr. Sackler had two brothers who were also psychiatrists. So the three Sackler brothers bought a drug company in New York City in 1952. It was called Purdue Frederick. Uh, they're, uh, their major product was laxatives. Uh, it was a very small business. Uh, they, you know, but the Sackler brothers got into it and they began to apply the techniques that Dr. Sackler had developed in the advertising world uh, to this business. Uh, and they then got into the business of marketing Valium. They, they didn't uh, own Valium, they didn't discover Valium, but they worked with Hoffman and LaRoche and they marketed Valium. And as a result, for the first time, we had a $100 million drug bill, and that was Valium. They, they also did their same wonders with Librium, uh, and uh, you'll see the, the next <coughs> part of our story. Now, I want to shift away from the drug companies, so we'll come back to them, and talk a little bit about sort of science and physicians and our attitudes, and, and this is how we got into serious trouble. Uh, this, this begins in 1980. Uh, there was a letter which is now pretty famous that occurred in the New England Journal. It was now called the Porter and Jick Letter. It described a very low incidence of addiction in hospitalized pain patients. The, I, I hate to tell you this, but this was all done by Boston University data. Uh, there was a very large database that existed at Boston Medical Center. Uh, that looked at all kinds of information on inpatients. And well, they went back and looked at this data and they asked the question around, they had information on 12,000 patients, inpatients. How many people got addicted? And the best they could tell, there were four cases of addiction among these 12,000 inpatients. Uh, so they had this brief letter. The brief letter, if you looked at it carefully, talked about inpatients. Uh, they talked about people being treated for acute pain, and nobody got prescriptions. They were in the hospital, they were dispensed medication for two to three, maybe four days. Uh, and then they were discharged and sent home. And practically nobody got addicted. Uh, that became a seminal piece of information, but over the next decade or two, it was grossly misinterpreted. Uh, because you would now find that references were made to this finding in the prestigious New England Journal as though it was really hardcore research. Uh, and the discussion was that all of a sudden it's safe to prescribe to outpatients with chronic pain and give them prescriptions. None of which was what was reported in this letter in the New England Journal. Uh, so we suddenly launched an era in American medicine where the concept of the safety of chronic opiate prescribing and the fact that practically nobody was going to get addicted was now becoming sort of common knowledge uh, for physicians. Uh, at the same time, there were quite legitimate issues about pain management and major concerns that we didn't do a very good job controlling pain uh, in, in American medicine, and that, that certainly is absolutely true. Uh, and people pushed uh, to try and do a better job with that. <laughs> Uh, not to be left out of this movement, uh, the Sackler brothers, their company is now called uh, Purdue Pharma, uh, but in 1984 they introduced MS Cotton. It was a time-release form of morphine analgesic. Uh, very good drug, actually, and there was actually minimal abuse problem with this drug. The time-release structure of the drug actually worked fairly well, uh, and it was a good market uh, for their company. The story progresses. Uh, in 1986, uh, there was a published paper in the Pain Journal by Foley and Portnoy. This supported the use of opioids for chronic pain. So we're now getting more and more reports saying uh, that this is a good idea. Uh, Purdue continues their work. In 1996, they produce OxyContin. Uh, 
Uh, the issue behind this was that as people were becoming more aggressive prescribing pain meds, the problem was the meds weren't potent enough and they didn't last long enough. And the technical issue was could we find a potent opiate that would last overnight so that pain patients didn't have to get up in the middle of the night and keep taking more medication. Uh, MS Cotton didn't work to do that, it wasn't potent enough. Uh, but oxycodone was. But they needed a time release formulation. The structure they used with MS Cotton actually didn't work with oxycotton. Uh, so they had to come up with a new mechanism for time release. Uh, they thought it would be safe. Uh, both the FDA and Purdue approved the use of uh, oxycotton as a time release formulation, and they didn't think they would have trouble with it. Uh, and the FDA agreed to let them market it for the use for chronic pain. Uh, 1996, within the same year, we suddenly get reports of pill mills. Uh, started in Appalachia and Kentucky. Uh, we had similar reports from Maine uh, and the upper parts of New England. But all of a sudden, uh, individuals with opiate use disorder were crushing their pills and snorting them. And OxyContin proved to be a wonderful pill to crush and snort and inject. Uh, and it didn't take very long uh, for individuals with the problem to recognize that they really had a potent medication that was going to work for them. Uh, at the same time, we're pushing very hard in medicine to make sure we do a really good job with pain. Uh, so in 1998, JCO, the Joint Commission, and the VA at that time pronounced pain as the fifth vital sign. So what was that message? The message was, Doc, you better pay attention to pain. Hospital, we're going to come and when we come in and inspect you, we're going to check whether you're paying attention to pain, do all your medical records, record the degree of pain that patients have. And nowadays, if you, if you look at the most immediate issue, you're finding lots of doctors complaining because they're being rated by patient surveys about how well they treated the patient's pain. And if the patient left their office still complaining of pain, the doctor's getting a, a black mark. Uh, and that may actually affect reimbursements uh, and how they're being rated as their quality of care delivery. Uh, so all of that really got triggered uh, by this concept of pain as the fifth vital sign. Now, what else was going on here? You see that top line? Uh, th that is the prescription of uh, opiates. You can see going here from 1999 to 2010, a lot of that is OxyContin. You see this enormous increase in sales. But what you can also see here, paralleling that is an increase in deaths per 100,000, and also the increase of admissions to people seeking treatment for opiate dependence. Uh, so the, it seems fairly clear now that uh, this marketing campaign and the, the use of opiates was leading uh, to lots of problems. Uh, now this is the, the more difficult part of the talk, uh, if you will, because it's fairly clear now that Purdue was aware early on that their drugs were being abused. Uh, they were getting reports uh, that uh, people were abusing the drugs, not taking them as, as they were directed. They ignored those reports. Uh, they aggressively marketed the drugs. Uh, they sort of harassed the FDA to try and change their labeling uh, so that there were more and more conditions that you could use OxyContin to treat. Uh, and you know, so they went to try to basically say if you had a headache, uh, you know, you needed a really potent opiate to manage it. Uh, so they pushed hard for do doing that. OxyContin eventually became a $1 billion a year business. Uh, the total estimated revenues now for that one drug are $35 billion. Uh, so just imagine what that means to a company that's owned by one family. Uh, so that, that's sort of been the story of OxyContin. Uh, in 2010, the FDA forced the reformulation of OxyContin into a, into a new formulation that actually was not particularly abusable. Uh, and in 2007, as part of that whole process, Purdue and three of their executives pleaded guilty to a, a misdemeanor charge of false branding. Uh, 
uh, and they were fined $634 million uh, for that uh, misdemeanor charge. Uh, that's probably significantly less than their profits in any one year uh, on the sale of, of OxyContin. Uh, anyone know what this building is? Pardon? Pardon? The Sackler Museum. Okay, so this is where at least part of the money went. Uh, th there are comparable museums like this in Paris, in London, in Washington, in New York. Uh, that's where a lot of the money went, so it, didn't, it wasn't all bad, <laughs> if you will, but a huge amount of money was involved in this. Now, I just want to put the opiate addiction problem in a somewhat broader context here. Uh, these are people who are starting to use selected substances uh, in the year 2014. And you can see at the bottom that alcohol and nicotine still are the biggest problem, and then marijuana, and then below that you see pain relievers. So that just gives you some sense of where this fits in the overall picture of substance abuse problems. This next thing uh, looks at where these drugs are coming from. And here the point that I want to make is that here are the prescriptions from one doctor, not doctor shopping. Uh, and here, these are the drugs that people are getting for free or from friends. So the point here is this is not an illegal distribution system. Uh, this market is being supported, if you will, by standard medical practice and then by patients who get the pills legitimately and then just pass them out to their friends or trade them with friends or occasionally sell them. Uh, but it's nothing like the system that we used to think about in terms of the illicit distri distribution of heroin. This changes as people become addicted. And you can see here that in the beginning, uh, when people are using very casually uh, the, the bulk of the medication they're getting, this blue part here, is all free from friends, relatives. As they, it changes slightly as they become more occasional users. When they really develop a chronic illness, you can see here we've shifted from free friends and pills uh, to an illicit distribution system. Uh, so now let's talk specifically about uh, addiction, pain, and psychiatric disorders. Uh, 40% of all the adults in the United States complain of chronic pain. Uh, the most common class of prescribed medications in the United States are opiate analgesics. I, I was surprised by that because I thought it was going to be benzos uh, and tranquilizers, but it really is not. It's opiate analgesics. Millions of people are getting these medications for long-term outpatient care. Uh, and as I mentioned to you before, the, the death toll is enormous related to this. Uh, the vulnerability, as I mentioned before, is a little bit more complicated if you ask the question, who gets addicted and why? Uh, addiction to other drugs is part of the vulnerability. Adolescents having a family history of substance use problems, co-occurring ADHD, major depression, and PTSD are clearly things that increase the vulnerability. And that's where everyone in this room has to pay attention. Uh, because you all are seeing patients with these conditions. And they have all at, at increased risk because of this. And, and it appears in general, if the drug potency is high enough and the exposure is long enough, that practically anyone can become addicted. Uh, I'm going to pass over this slide. I want to get to this slide here. Uh, he, this looks at s types or range of psychiatric conditions. Uh, the question is, how common is this? occur in people with chronic pain compared to the general population. So how depression occurs in about 45% of the people with chronic pain is compared to about 5% of the general population. Anxiety disorders, about 25% of the people with chronic pain. Personality disorders, over 50% of the people with chronic pain. Uh, PTSD, only about 1% of the general population have PTSD. If you look at the pain population, it's double that 2%. But if you work where I am in the VA, it's 49%. And so there's a huge overlap of recent veterans with physical injuries, TBIs, PTSD, exposure to potent opiates when they were being treated, and now opiate dependence. So it's been a major problem. Uh, 
So in general, the, the incidence of co-occurring psychiatric disorders is two or three times higher in chronic pain patients than it is in the general population. Depression, anxiety disorders, PTSD are the most common. And this Venn diagram just throws all this together. This is a picture from VA patients, but it shows you the enormous overlap uh, in lots of our patients of various multiple psychiatric disorders, psychiatric diagnosis, PTSD, TBI, and pain. Uh, so uh, what's the risk? We now recognize that if you are treated with opiates for a longer period of time, you have a very high risk for developing an addiction disorder, an opiate use disorder. About 35% of the people, not four out of 12,000, but about 35% of the people receiving these meds chronically are going to develop an opiate use disorder. Uh, now, just a few comments at the end here. Uh, I want to pull together some of this information and just focus on a few points. First of all, prescription opiates have replaced heroin as the driving force for the opiate use problem in the United States. Secondly, physicians and healthcare deliverers, we are the problem. We are a major part of the problem. It's no longer in the legal system that we can forget about or ignore. We have to take responsibility for that. Drug overdose deaths are killing people that we are part of the vulnerability to that. Uh, the CDC is working very hard to change medical practice around pain prescribing, and then most of that focus is being directed at primary care clinicians. Uh, but we're standing at the side, uh, and I think we have to ask, where does psychiatry fit into this? Well, we fit in a major way. Uh, most of these chronic pain patients have psychiatric disorders. Uh, and if our colleagues in primary care are going to learn how to manage them with no opiates or with lower doses of opiates, they're going to have to engage with psychiatry uh, in terms of learning better ways of managing chronic pain uh, and more effective ways of treating co-occurring psychiatric disorders. Psychiatry actually has a good head start in this. Uh, of all the medical specialties, we're the ones who I think recognized addiction first. Uh, we've had a lot of experience in our routine work of managing long-term chronic illness. Uh, our residencies provide more information on addictions than any other medical specialty does. You know, so despite the problems, uh, psychiatry has been a leader. And I would particularly focus on consultation liaison work because I think that's where the interface with primary care is and that's where I think we really uh, have a major role to play. Uh, in terms of resolving this problem uh, and changing the situation. Uh, just a few comments about buprenorphine. As Shelley mentioned before, this began with Data 2000. This was an effort to, be, to take the treatment of opiate dependence and bring it back into mainstream medicine. Buprenorphine is a much safer drug, but most important, it's a drug that can be prescribed in a physician's office or in a hospital. A deliberate attempt to get this back into standard medical care. Uh, the psychiatrists were very involved in the beginning with the prescribing of buprenorphine. Unfortunately, now the percentages of psychiatrists have actually dropped. The number, the absolute numbers are going up, but primary care is becoming uh, more active in prescribing. And, and I think that we need to really refocus our attention, get more psychiatrists involved, more psychiatrists uh, prescribing. Uh, we've tried hard, and Shelley's been part of this, uh, to try and get required training on addiction increased in general residencies, and we're trying hard to get requirements for buprenorphine training into all the general residencies. And we're doing that well in Massachusetts, but we, we'd like to get that required across the country. Uh, so what's our responsibility? Uh, I think we have to expand psychiatry's role uh, in treating individuals with opiate use disorders. I think we have to expand our skill sets. We have to learn how to do, manage these complex patients with pain, with co-occurring addictions and co-occurring psychiatric disorders. That ought to be common practice for every psychiatrist. Uh, not, not just specialists. We need to partner with primary care to do that. And the one thing that, that is worth a whole other talk is the prescribing of buprenor or prescribing of benzos and being more conservative with that. But I would go beyond that. I think we have to pay attention to what's happening in the outside world. 
Uh, I think we have to be very wary of technology. Uh, I hope that one of the things you take home from this talk is to recognize that as science has progressed, as technology has progressed, as the new medications have progressed, it's not been an easy story. Uh, and I think we have been led to think that you know all these technological advances are really going to be wonderful and are going to solve problems and are going to not have a cost to them. And it turns out that the cost is major. Uh, and, and I think we have to pay attention to that. I think we have to reinforce the role of the FDA. Uh, and I think we have to start paying much more attention to corporate greed. Uh, and I want to just throw in this little bit. Uh, the market for OxyContin in the U.S. dropped dramatically after 2010. Uh, Purdue Pharma then created a whole new set of companies called Mundi Pharma. Uh, they're scattered all over the world. They are now marketing OxyContin in the rest of the world uh, with the same kind of aggressive techniques that they can't really continue to use in the U.S. Uh, but they've gone after Latin America. Their physicians from the U.S. are now being paid more than a million dollars a year to go down to Latin America and give talks to doctors to tell them, you know, how they're doing a bad job because they're not prescribing enough opiates and how safe opiates are and how risk-free this is. Uh, so I think we have to pay attention to that. And then just lastly, I want to sort of finish with uh, uh, one comment about uh, naloxone. Uh, and Narcan this is the opiate reversal drug uh, that is critical to reversing opiate overdoses and saving lives. Uh, been available since 1971. In 2005, Pfizer's generic was costing $1 for a one millimeter vial. Uh, by 2014, Pfizer had increased that price to $15 a vial. Uh, not to be outdone, other manufacturers got in the act. Right now, there are new formulations, uh, some of which are going to cost you $125 for two doses, but the auto injector, which was in that last slide, is going to cost you almost $4,000 for a single auto injector. Uh, well, just that, that's what's in the, the bottom picture here. So. If you, if you have a child who's addicted to opiates, if you have someone who's taking large doses of opiates for pain and you're worried about their overdose, for $4,000 you can purchase that and have it in your house uh, and uh, you can reverse an, an overdose with a drug that probably shouldn't cost more than a dollar. Uh, so uh, on that I will stop and see if you have any uh, comments or questions. One ominous implication from your talk for me is that unlike the widespread heroin use in U.S. forces in Southeast Asia in the late 60s and early 70s, the opioid epidemic that some people thought was going to happen didn't really seem to happen, as opposed to what's going on now, yeah. where we could have a major new opioid epidemic and soldiers returning from the Near East. Yeah, there there was an increase in heroin use disorder after every major war that occurred after the First World War and the Second World War and a little bit after Vietnam, but it was never the dimensions uh, of what we're seeing right now. Uh, and they, there certainly was an uptick, uptick uh, but it just didn't get anywhere near the problem that we've got right now. And I think the I think part of the story there is that. Pharmaceutical opiates are far more potent than the heroin, and the heroin that was available after Vietnam was, cr it was crummy. I mean, it just was not high quality. It was expensive. It was difficult to maintain a major habit, and a lot of people returned from Vietnam addicted and then couldn't even find heroin when they got back to Kansas or things like that, you know. Uh, a lot of them turned into having alcohol problems, but they didn't continue uh, with opiates. Yes. Uh, there are studies that show what the how the quality of life works out for the people who are kept on Suboxone or or methadone for long periods of time. I mean, is that is that the goal to have all these yes. people on these substances? 
Yeah, I, I think the, the, all the data that we have suggests that if people are going to be maintained on methadone or buprenorphine, they probably, you're probably looking at long-term lifetime treatment. And I think you should think about it the same way you would think about someone with bipolar disorder. If you stabilize them on lithium or other medications, you, you know, you're, you're looking at managing that for the rest of their life. Uh, a lot of these people do very well, probably 60 to 70 percent end up being pretty highly functioning. About 20 or 30 percent don't do very well. Uh, and unfortunately, that, that subpopulation turn out to be highly visible. Uh, because of stigma, most of the people who are doing well on methadone or buprenorphine no, never advertise it. Uh, they, they simply don't want people to know who they are and how well they're doing. Uh, and uh, we're, we're struggling with how we can reverse that and try and get the message out that people can function extremely well on these medications when they're taking them as directed. And the majority of them actually do. But, but it often takes a year or two for the treatment to become effective and for people to learn how to do that. Uh, and we're still, I'm hoping someday Roger will publish a lot more data with some of the long-term follow-ups from the CTN studies because we, we don't have a lot of that published data. But if you come to our clinics, I think we can show you lots of patients that we've had for 20 years who are doing extremely well. So. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I have a question about the work of John Kabat-Zinn, who worked with uh, chronic uh, severe pain patients. Uh, what do you see as the role for these kinds of psychological interventions? Well, I think they're grossly underutilized. Uh, I think we all bought into the idea that the pain pills were the simple quick fix. Uh, and I think we're just rediscovering that there's this whole other world where there are approaches that can be very effective. Uh, it's not easy to get people off of opiates once they've been on for a very long time. And I think that we probably have to focus more on the people who are just entering treatment at this point and making sure that they're exposed to these other types of approaches. Uh, and mindfulness and anything within that general area is, is certainly effective and in the long run may be more effective than the opiates. There, there's some data showing now that a lot of people with chronic pain given opiates end up with more pain at the end. There's a small percentage who probably do well long term, but there seem to be a significant number where the pain just gets worse, but now they've got two problems. They, they've got ongoing pain and they've also got opiate dependence.